Good morning, fellow Toastmasters and guests. I will present the affirmative position on two of the four types of visas in the resolution, family-based visas and human trafficking-based visas. PJ will focus on the other two visa types, employment-based immigrant visas and non-immigrant temporary worker visas. First, I'm going to tell you about one of the principles of U.S. policy on permanent immigration and define some of the key visa elements. Then I'll summarize the affirmative position. Then for the two visa types, I'll outline in detail why the status quo isn't working. Next, I'll identify the specific changes needed, and then I'll explain the effects these changes will have. So that we can better judge the resolution, it's important we understand the major goal of U.S. policy on permanent immigration, and some of the key elements of permanent immigration. Reunification of families is one of the major principles that underlie U.S. policy on permanent immigration. I repeat, reunification of families is one of the major principles that underlie U.S. policy on permanent immigration. This principle is embodied in the Immigration and Nationality Act, established in 1952, modified many times since then. The key elements I'll cite were found in the Congressional Research Service Report for Congress, on U.S. Immigration Policy on Permanent Admissions of April 2010. The Immigration and Nationality Act establishes an annual worldwide permanent immigration level of 675 lawful permanent residents. There are three major components to this worldwide level. First, there are family-sponsored immigrants, which includes U.S. citizens' immediate relatives. Second, there are visas for employment-based preference immigrants. And the third component is for winners of the Diversity Lottery Program. Each component has a unique limit. The diversity lottery program limit is 55,000. The employment-based preference immigrant limit is 140,000. For the family-sponsored immigrant component, which includes U.S. citizens' immediate relatives, the total limit is 480,000. However, since there's no limit on the visas for U.S. citizens' immediate relatives, the number of visas for family-sponsored immigrants is equal to what remains after subtracting 480,000 from the visas for U.S. citizens' immediate relatives. Limits are also in place for preference categories within each type of visa group, and a per-country limit is in place. The limits vary by preference category, but the country limit is 7% of the worldwide level. <coughs> Family-sponsored and employment-based visas are processed in the order in which they are filed. As a result, however, when the demand for visas exceeds the per-country or category limits, a backlog of visa applications is created. These backlogs can result in years-long wait. Summary. The affirmative position is simple. To fulfill the principles of U.S. policy on permanent immigration, which is the reunification of families, the resolution must be adopted. The status quo is not working. The wait times for many family-based preference visas are too long, and a key criteria for human trafficking visas is too restrictive. And the limit on these visas is about one-third the estimate on the number of victims. The status quo is not working. There are three key reasons. One, the backlog in many of the family-based visa categories is simply too large and the result of what happens when the demand for visas exceeds the per-country limit. The waiting period is excessive and prevents families from being reunited. It keeps families apart. For example, looking at the visa bulletin for February issued by the Department of State, Bureau of Consular Affairs, Visa applications submitted for unmarried sons and daughters of U.S. citizens from Mexico submitted in January 1993, 17 years ago, are now being processed. Visa applications submitted for unmarried sons and daughters of U.S. lawful permanent residents from the Dominican Republic submitted in January 1997, 14 years ago, are now being handled. The most substantial waiting times are for prospective family-sponsored immigrants from the Philippines. Immigration officers are now considering petitions of the brother and sisters of U.S. citizens from the Philippines who filed visa requests 23 years ago. While it might be easy to take a cold, logical view of visas, forms, limits, and bulletins, it's important to state that these applicants are real people with spouses, sons, daughters, mothers, and fathers who are unable to be with their families. Second, there are many causes to illegal immigration economic, quality of life, trade liberalization, overpopulation, or wars. However, the desire to reunite with families here in the U.S. is one cause of illegal immigration. In Douglas Massey's book, Beyond Smoke and Mirrors, he reports that the likelihood of Mexican nationals entering the U.S. increases substantially if family members are already here. Third, 
Further evidence of the need for immigration reform can also be seen by simply looking at the volume of federal and state legislative activity over the past several years. While the Congressional Research Report on U.S. Immigration Policy of April 2010 included a laundry list of federal immigration proposals, the state's attempts to fix this problem have actually been more voluminous and controversial. According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, state legislatures enacted a record number of laws and resolutions addressing immigration issues in 2010. Forty-six state legislatures and the District of Columbia enacted 208 laws and adopted 138 resolutions. Anybody not hear of Arizona Senate Bill 1070, which according to the April 2010 New York Times article, quote, is the nation's toughest bill on illegal immigration. Human trafficking visas are granted to victims of human trafficking, a modern day form of slavery. Human trafficking visas allow victims of human trafficking to remain in the U.S. to help in an investigation of human trafficking. There are several estimates of the human trafficking in the U.S., but the lowest estimate, according to the most recent Department of Justice estimate, and specified in the assessment of U.S. government activities to combat trafficking of persons, is that there are between 14,500 and 17,500 victims trafficked into the U.S. every year. Despite this estimate, however, the number of human trafficking visas is limited to just 5,000. Finally, lest you think human trafficking is not a problem locally, think again. On January 18th, WBTV Charlotte published a story stating that North Carolina ranks as the eighth most likely state in the U.S. where human trafficking occurs. The eligibility criteria for human trafficking includes, among many items, that the victim provide a signed declaration from a law enforcement agency which certifies that the applicant is a victim of a severe form of trafficking in persons. Sounds simple enough, but it isn't. While many of us may agree with Dr. Laura Ledeter of the State Department and Lisa Thompson, a trafficking advocate for the Salvation Army, that all human trafficking is severe, the typical cases accounted by law enforcement personnel don't meet the severe threshold. As Derek March, co-director of the California Orange County Human Trafficking Force Task Force reported to Congress, House Committee on Homeland Security, the emphasis on severe human trafficking has undermined many potential human trafficking investigations. In the co-director's testimony, he said that the typical case involves finding victims who are subjected to more psychological and situational coercion and duress tactics. The typical case is one of commercial sex exploitation, where the victims have their passports taken, identification of valuable, valuables immediately taken, they're kept in brothels secured by closed circuit TVs, the money taken in by the women are controlled by the traffickers, the victims are escorted everywhere, are required to work 21 day cycles, with seven days off in accordance with their menstrual period, and receive significant monetary compensation for their services. Due to the current criteria language, these typical cases are not considered severe by many law enforcement agencies. To reunite families by reducing the wait times, the Immigration and Nationality Act must be changed to expand the number of immigrants allowed to receive a visa. To protect victims of human trafficking into the U.S., the criteria must be changed and the limit increased. Specifically, the following changes are needed. One, change the process for calculating the number of family-based visas by no longer deducting the immediate relatives of U.S. citizens from the overall family-sponsored numerical limit of 480,000. Two, raise the current per-country limit of 7% to 10%. These two changes will likely add at least 226 immigrants to the U.S. and ease wait times for applicants from oversubscribed countries like China, India, Mexico, and the Philippines. Three, change the human trafficking visa hardship criteria to remove the severe limiter. And four, increase the limit on human trafficking visas from 5,000 to 15,000 to better align with the victim estimates. These two changes would increase the protection of the number of human trafficking victims. Will a resulting increase in immigrants create new problems? The answer is no. Not from an economic viewpoint or family structure viewpoint. According to the United States Research Council's study, the New Americans Economic Demographic and Fiscal Effects of Immigration, overall, immigration has a net economic gain. The study also reports that immigrants contribute as much as $10 billion to the U.S. economy each year. And according to the National Academy of Sciences' New America study, immigrants increase the gross national product by $200 billion each year. According to the Kauffman Foundation, which specializes in promoting innovation in America, the index of entrepreneurial activity is nearly 40% higher for immigrants than for natives. Robert Litton of the Kauffman Foundation reports that roughly 25% of successful high 
tech startups over the last decade were founded or co-founded by immigrants. From a family pers structure perspective, according to the same U.S. National Research Council study, immigrants are more likely than native-born people of the same age to be married and less likely to be divorced, widowed, or separated. The perception of immigration of single young men with little connection to place, country, or family is simply not true. Instead, it's couples who are married and starting families. Why is this important? Because the structure of the family is central to the way immigrants affect the U.S. society. In summary, to fulfill the principles of U.S. policy on permanent immigration, which includes the reunification of family, the resolution must be adopted. The wait time for many family-based preference visas are too long, a key criteria for human trafficking visas is too restrictive, and the limit of these visas is about a third the estimate of the number of victims. The specific changes I've made are feasible, they're not new, and will have a positive effect upon when implemented for the new immigrants and the U.S. as a whole. Thank you for your attention.